uh, any any questions? I'll 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 try to facilitate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So basically, he's trying to say, "Oh, we're um, you're getting distracted by Trump's nuttiness." Yeah. Well. Real, yeah. Well, real things are, are, are happening. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, yeah. It's I have yeah. I have two things to say about yeah, that. There's well, a lot. Yeah, there, well, yeah. I have more than two things. Um, I would say anything that Trump is doing, especially if it's a policy or something that is impacting people and is is going to lead to people suffering, it's never a distraction. Yeah. And I am. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what you're saying, but I feel like that yeah. argument is often used in that context, yes. and it needs to stop because that is the height of cynicism. And and it, again, it builds into that that notion that these things are at odds, that we can't pay attention to what yes. this lunatic is doing in the White House and mobilize and organize on multiple issues. So the notion that those two things are at odds, again, absurd. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it's because we need to connect the idea of, of of how organizing works, which is a narrative, and the stories we tell about ourselves actually can connect all of us together, so that we can move, right? So that we can act. And so, you know, there's people are going to fulfill different roles, right? There's going to be people who are going to mind the Twitter, they're going to pay attention to the Twitter, yeah. talk back, organize around the Twitter, yeah. And then there's going to be the people who are probably more better served for you know on the ground kind of organizing so right. i think i think we can have both Let's have totally both. totally yeah and i mean i yeah i want to stress that like when when we're talking about um trump promoting promoting racism or trump you know pushing forward a policy that's going to have real reper- repercussions for people we need to be paying attention when it comes to him uh misspelling things on twitter just proving the fact that he's not an intelligent person uh that can be distracting if we're just focusing on that, you know, and it's unnecessary because it's like, we already know, we know that, you know, like, let's move on. Let's, you know, energy needs to be, we have limited energy. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is essentially, um, you know, the, the notion that the marginalized majority can have power is great if we sort of assume that America is this meritocracy is this egalitarian place, but what about all this institutional and infrastructural, you know, baked in crap? Um, like, yeah. So, and, and gerrymandering comes to mind. You know, we're talking about a constant uh, assault and attack on um, the voices of the marginalized. I, I guess my response would be twofold. One is that I think if more people are aware of these assaults and how direct and obvious they are, like this move to disenfranchise voters, it's just so transparent. Uh, I think that is a big part of of the problem is the awareness because it's hopefully going to then translate into mobilizing and demanding that our local representatives and above take action and resist this. We have to row this boat while we're patching it up, like while we're fixing it, right? So I feel like that's what we have to hold. You know, on the one hand, yes, you know, voting rights has been gutted. Um, The two-party system is still not working for us. You know, there's so many things structurally, and let's work on that, but also real life is happening, right? So how do we, I think we can do both. Oh, I just remembered what it was. Yes. Okay, so um, during Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street, I was working on a article where I was exploring the feasibility of like a massive labor strike and like what's the, what's the oh. feasibility of it? What's the legality of it? So I called up this longtime um, labor uh, lawyer who had been, you know, union rep uh, and, and worked in that, you know, worked in that field for, for decades. And I was like, okay, so like, is this legal? Like, can this work? You know, cause of course it's like, if a bunch of people like, are they going to risk being fired? Like what's the recourse? And, uh, I felt like he was willfully not responding to my question. We kept going around in circles and he was like, basically what he was trying to say was that law follows power. Yeah. And I mean that both obviously in terms of like, if it's, a handful of extremists who are pushing the terms and of the conversation, it's going to go that way. But that, you know, law is not some sort of inherently egalitarian thing. It's practiced by human beings and it exists in the system that is already profoundly not, um, that's already so bigoted. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so what he was saying is like, well, yeah, no, maybe it's not legal now across the board, but if everyone is, if there is a majority of people, demanding if there's a majority of people who are organizing consistently the law will follow that yeah and so i guess that just comes to mind in terms of like yeah it's gonna be a fight but if we sort of recognize that our demands the the cross-section of what the many demands that we share 
uh, if we recognize that and push forward, law and power will follow. I wouldn't connect Solidaridad with intersectionality because the history of the labor movement has been extremely racist and anti-woman. So I, I would, I, I mean, even though women and, and people of color have also organized in labor. Does that make sense? So I just, you know, I, I get it. We, we're not gonna go into an argument right now, but I, I, just, I just wanna throw that out there that, you know, I appreciate you giving us more information. There is something about, we need to create a culture that is accessible. And to me, we need to figure out the, what the words, what the words mean, what the, why they're loaded, and if we need to, in fact, you know, use new words. So if we want to say solidarity, sometimes, you know, labor movement words, sometimes I don't use it because people don't understand it, you know? And I think that's, I think if anything, what I'm getting from your book is we need, we are the majority and we need to figure out what narratives we need to create in order to tell uh, ourselves that story that we are the majority. Right, and, and to reinstill them with the appropriate meaning so that yes. everyone, so that the people who have been historically marginalized recognize themselves can make common cause with yeah. those with those concepts that have been um not that warm and welcoming yeah. historically because I'll, I'll be honest you know i left the labor movement this is what i so so the, if, if you hear any anger coming from what i'm saying is because i was because she's an angry woman i am <laughs> But because, you know, me and my friends who were, who were in our 20s, hotshot directors of an 85,000 member union, we all left within a year because we did not feel that the leadership was truly fulfilling what they thought they were trying to do, which is to change and adjust to the realities of the labor market, right, and of power. And as you know, we have still been degrading in our union membership yeah. in the percentage of the workforce. So, you know... My anger is not toward directed toward you in particular, but it's just in general, there is a huge disconnect between those who are on the left, who are still holding whatever the left institutions of powers are to, to the people that we are dealing with right now, which is people like you and me, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I, I just want to kind of throw that out there. You no, know, it's important to unpack what we mean by solidarity. Yeah. You know, it's not, it, it, it's a powerful word, but it doesn't inherently speak to, it, no. it's not, it's not uh, doing the same work as when you say intersectionality. Sometimes, we, we it need, depends. Yeah, yeah. You're saying, sorry. She was bringing up it, yeah. that his, you know, historically something like uh, the NRA, like there's popular, like from the outside looks like fear mongering institution, but internally they're they're creating these really powerful narratives and making it like fun to be engaged and a part of it. So you know, an organization like the ACLU, these progressive organizations, like we need to recognize that strong storytelling and fun and connectivity and focusing on social social connections yeah. uh, and that kind of important thread work, it's vital. You know, it's vital to sustain movements um that's yeah. why culture and art is important yes i know i mean yeah. uh, do, do you see when i think about the nra i think about these like viral photos of like really petite blonde women who are wearing like tight clothing and like have like a gun in their in their <laughs> waistband <laughs> or in their purse and, and it's like nothing gets between me and my gun you know well, i don't yeah. know what she whatever she's saying yeah. and then like of course n you know logic like l inevitably the, on the the people who don't like it are like um look at she's such a clown and then right. like the people who care about you know guns they're like she's awesome like yeah. but that's what it is right that's like that's like part of the nra culture is to be like i'm a lady and i can make a pink gun you know and it was <laughs> they sell pink guns like that's culture. That's like yeah. art and culture and design and growing fun. Up growing up shooting, with your, up shooting yeah. with your grandfather. No, totally. Right. So we need to figure out what that is for us if if we're on the marginalized majority side. No? Yeah. No, I think we're doing it. We just we are, we also are, people okay. people and yeah, I think people who are heads of these organizations <laughs> need to be, you know, being more mindful of that. Yeah. Also, and inviting the right people in to tell the stories. I think um, so. Hire me. <laughs> I have some other friends that you should hire as well. Yeah, I actually, you. yeah, I like, I, <laughs> I, you know, a, f a few colleagues in my, uh, colleagues of, of, of mine and, and, and I, right after the election, started an organization called Speech Act, which, you know, focuses on teaching storytelling and narrative to social justice organizations and nonprofits. Ooh. And this is not new. There are other organizations that have been doing this kind of work, but we need more of it, right? Uh, because a lot of times, especially when we've been working in the trenches for so long, again, we burn out. Yes. Uh, or we, uh, we're just so tired of, of kind of reiterating the mission, or we're, we're already so bought in that we forget 
yeah. the the stories. We forget yeah. the reason, the emotional evocative reasons behind uh, why we're here and why it matters so much for us to to spread our stories, uh, to, to connect us, right? Like the point is we're already out there. We just need to recognize ourselves as part of this this broader collective, as a, as a political force to be reckoned with. I think I think the left and progressives right now and uh, the, the soon-to-be progressives that just don't know it yet. Um, yeah, we, we, we have historically kind of been on the, on the sidelines. Uh, what do I mean by that? Not on the sidelines as in not protesting, not engaging, but kind of this sense that we don't have power. Yeah. This historical sense that, that, you know, because we have been historically so disenfranchised that we sort of come to the table sometimes, I think, already counting ourselves out. Um, and, it's, and it's just sort of this knee-jerk reaction that I think I think we can do better yeah 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 so basically kind of she's she's recognizing and and pointing out that you know uh there's something of a shift or or you know this this question of what's happening right now where you know maybe we we a lot of us were at this point where we thought well voting for a female president is the most radical act to like well what are we seeing now it seems like there's more of more the support for like socialism and that is a movement rather than this more establishment uh democratic party um, and also touching on, you know, these different voting contingents like the soccer moms uh, and, and who are they now? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is the obvious tension that comes out of the realization that the establishment Democratic Party, um, while obviously quite different from the Republican Party, still, when you look at the party platform, is so far right of what the majority of Americans want. Uh so it, it's just a problem. Yeah. It's a real problem. And so the Democratic Party needs to step up yeah. like fast <laughs> because, it, I mean, I think we're seeing that divide happening now um, more and more. Yeah. What's, you know, where uh, where on the w- the whole this whole talk, right, is basically about reframing where the majority's interests are. And what we're saying is, is we need to start talking about how Democrats and Republicans are actually center right you know, reside there, and there there is no yeah. oppositional, exactly. And yeah. so I think that the, the rise of the sort of democratic socialist uh, movements, I know in LA, it's, it's been a growing um, chapter, the DSA, um, and then Alexandria, I know. And the fact that, you know, the question of Palestine always gets, uh, gets potential elected officials in trouble who might come from, yeah, who might come from a different background because it's like the th- weird third rail, like you can't say anything about supporting Palestinian people's human rights yeah. without being called an like anti-Semite. An anti-Semite. Yeah. I mean, it just goes from zero to 60 yeah. on that, yeah. you know? Um, so that's just really unfortunate. And we just have so much work to do. I have prejudices around socialists, mm-hmm. even though I cons- consider myself probably a democratic socialist. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's usually just white dudes that really make me feel alienated <laughs> and <laughs> reinforce the patriarchy. I mean, like, I mean, yeah. that's just like... I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, people, some, some progressives didn't vote for Sanders because of that, you know? So it's just hard. Even I voted for Sanders. I mean, what are we doing, you guys? Like, we got to figure this <laughs> out, you know? So I feel like we need to ad- address these. We need to address these things. And otherwise, I mean, the most logical people who should be all, all together and on each other's sides, we are being divided because yeah. we've, been, we've been told to be divided, you know? And so we're, this is part of the undoing. Totally. And I mean, I think a lot about, you know, coming of age and being reluctant to identify as a feminist. Uh, you know, I grew up in the South and, you know, there was a lot of uh, like apolitical, being apolitical, being colorblind, being the sort of like, that's the polite and most neutral and most welcoming kind of thing that you could be. Um, And it took, you know, it just takes recognizing that um, feminism exists and the Black Lives Matter movement exists because what is happening (laughs) is that we live in a country in which if you are a woman, if you are black, if you are a minor- minority, you live in a radically different country. Yeah. You are paid differently. You have a shorter lifespan. Your access to resources. I mean, so in, in my mind, with such fundamental things that are still so apparently wrong and that need to be addressed, like people just need, like people in power, people who are running for office, they need to be addressing these core things. Yeah. Otherwise, no vote. Just, it just it, There's just such fundamental things that need to happen. Mm, so much to do right here. What so makes you not questions. feel hopeless? You know, I mean, like, yeah. um, 
Yeah, I mean, if you sort of already referred to like, you know, it's, it is both and, you know, and, and I talk in the book about uh, immediately after the election, there was a, a group of folks who came together. Some of us knew each other, but a lot, a lot of us were strangers to each other. And uh, we all wanted to take part in some, you know, really groundbreaking action that would be easily replicable across the country, kind of like Occupy Wall Street that, you know, it was like no to this election, no to these, uh, you know, just a big no. And there was so much fervor and energy and, you know, really seasoned activists who were part of like the WTO protests, who were part of Occupy Wall Street. And all of us were down, you know, like yeah. short of a few people, we were like ready to be arrested. You know, like we had we had those conversations yeah. like, you know, and I talk about how it fell apart. Um, so basically what happened is while we all had such energy there emerged this divide. We were on board for this action, but when it came time to write, to come up with our um, platform statement, all of these questions about what we were, the words we were willing to use, democracy, America, American, using the American flag, for instance, there were such spirited divides, right? And, and in the end, we decided to part ways. Mm. And I talk about that for a variety of reasons, but one of which is, while it was disappointing, there have been offshoots and a bunch of different people have now taken part in different actions and they do have different approaches and that's okay and it's it's still moving us forward mm -hmm. but also um for me it was a formative moment because well first of all so so it's not a failure right yeah. like what on the surface might look like a failure it's not um but then also i feel like we really need to be willing from my perspective be willing to take back the meaning of those those words uh, and fight for them. Like patriotism. American. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, I and it's that's very it's, important for it's us. It's so too. uncomfortable. And when I, you know, those those arguments that we were having, a lot of times I feel like asking, like, what does it mean when we say democracy? What does it mean when we say American? You know, the, the, the fracturing that was going on was legitimate, right? It's like those words have been wielded, you know, in ways against so many people in a way that, like, they're too corrupted. We can, you know, and I respect that opinion. I think there's a lot of validity to it. But... I don't, uh, you know, for, from my standpoint, if we don't t try to read on those terms, yeah. we already know what happens. You know, a handful of extremists takes takes them over and tries to use them as their emblems. Right, to say you're un-American, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, you know, in terms of addressing burnout, I mean, I burnt out mostly because, you know, I was on my own little journey <laughs> of figuring out what made me happy. And, you know, um, I had a lot of responsibility in a very politically fractious, is that a word, um, environment of the labor union. It's a very big, powerful labor union. Um, and it just didn't feel like it was a place for me anymore because I didn't look up to the people that were above me anymore. I was a director at the end. So, um, yeah. So but that's what happened. And, I, and, and, and there, there was a part of me that thought, I always knew from being a high school student government nerd that it would be a foregone conclusion that I work in politics in some capacity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until college activism that I realized what my politics were, right? And then I was like, okay, then I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to work at something. And it ended up being the labor movement, right? But it, 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 in my head, that was the path that was laid out in front of me that was the natural path that most people assumed, right, where you become a, a political yeah. professional. And I think what was scary but exciting was if I were to drop doing that kind of work but um, honor the more creative side of my skills, which is not to say I don't use my business skills at all or organizing skills. I use my organizing skills all the time yeah. in what I do now, which is why I have a career. But I wanted to uh, honor my creativity more. And now I would say in, going in, the, in the spirit of not calling things failures yeah. that – as much as sometimes I'm like, I wish I like started doing comedy in like college, you know, like the way a lot of like people are like, I've always been a comedy nerd. I wish I did that because maybe I would have gotten farther with my craft, but I wouldn't be who I am without having had that experience of working in the trenches in the labor union, in the labor movement, door knocking, all of it, all the rhetoric that we did, you know, it all feeds into my understanding of the world and then therefore, um, my role and the skills I have in trying to talk back at it, <laughs> right? Yeah. As a comedian or as a convener or a storyteller or um, an organizer of artists essentially now is what I do. So, um, yeah, yeah, that journey of like finding your voice. Yes. And, and you know, when I'm talking about this group and the way we split, but then we're doing different actions, it's like I had to travel that journey of feeling like it was a failure at first 
And then recognizing that like, oh, what happened was this organic gravitating towards each other. The, the people who were like, yes, this is how I see this too. Let's move forward with our action, which isn't in opposition really to these other groups also moving forward and doing necessary and vital work, you know? Yeah. And, and I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves um, to like do the most good, right? Like I need to be doing the thing that is the most effective, the most functional right now. Um, and obviously being practical and thinking about having a real impact is important, but I think we, we discount the importance of where is this sustainable? Yeah. Where, where am I going to be able to feel like my voice has room and space and where am I going to be recharged and refueled? You know, and that said, obviously you need to be able to like step away sometimes and yeah. like read a, you know, trashy book, watch trashy TV, go walk in the park. Cause you just can't keep doing this stuff 24 hours a day. Yeah. But, um, you know, there are ways in which you can be part of protest and part of change that still are refueling, refueling you. And so to just be like, aware of emotionally what's what's taking too much from you I think is really healthy yeah I think we have time for maybe just one more and then and then yeah oh man who are who are the protagonists and authors that I look to today um oh man this is rough because there are so many and also I'm on the spot so it's you like recommended a couple books earlier yeah yes uh yes thank you um I listen sometimes <laughs> So L. A. Kaufman's direct action is fantastic in terms of like you know she really digs into um, the history of protest movements and you know what I was talking about in terms of like surfacing the real history and and instrumental actors who tend to go totally unnoticed or unremarked on and she she really unpacks that um, yeah and Steve Phillips's uh, Brown Is the New White is obviously great uh, I'm also an avid fiction reader so um, I mean Dady Smith. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, what else have I been reading lately? I don't know. We can talk. I don't want to like, yes, we should talk books. So many books. So many books. So, so many. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do we need to close out in any particular way other than get oh, a book? Wait, and uh, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, which Ooh. just came out is, I, I just started reading it. It's so good. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, How do we do this book signing thing? Well, I think, uh, yeah, if you want to oh, buy. Yay. 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 Yes. Yay. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. Yeah, that was great. Um, and thank you to Skylight Books. I love this book. I've never been here before, and it's awesome. Um, yeah, I think I'll just hang out up here. So if, uh, if you want me to sign a book, I will, I will be here. Thank you. <laughs>